we didn't receive ministry by propaganda. We didn't receive ministry by publicity. One of the things that some of you will complain about is that our publicity is too poor. Am I right? Because we are not on the television, we are not on the internet to, to share, yes, something, it, something serious is taking place, um, tata for Jesus. <laughs> Bilea canis storms um, tata with heavenly message. No. That's not what gave us ministry. What gave us ministry, brothers and sisters? Mercy. And if it is messy, we need to justify it. And part of it is that we have renounced hidden things of dishonesty. We don't need to hide anything. We are not working in craftiness because we don't intend to impress you. Hallelujah. And we do not handle the word of God deceitfully. We don't make the word of God softer for sinners. We don't make the word of God look, you know, palatable so that people with careless taste can come for it. When the word of God was going yesterday, a, a sister came to talk to me and said, as I'm hearing, I said, this is a hard thing. Something say, run away from this one. But another one said, where are you running to? So she came with tears, trembling, crying. I said, it's okay. That's how we are okay. Even me, I would have run out long ago. <laughs> but you see, the mercy of God, no matter how serious the word of God is, that's where there is life. If you endure sound doctrine, you will be sound. If you flee, fill your, your life with junks, you will become junky. If you need a life, a ministry that endures, stay with the enduring word of God. Not handling the word of God how deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth. By the manifestation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Will you please take note that God has included you in what he wanted to do. God has decided to have mercy on you, but because it's mercy, not merit. Stop pretending. What did I say you should do? Stop pretending. Don't think we will be embarrassed if we see that many things are not actually put in place. We will not be embarrassed because God, who decided to have mercy on you, has not been embarrassed. One day God said to me, he said, look, I already knew you before I called you. I have counted all the costs, all the complications and the implications before I decided to call you. So your, your, your problem is not my embarrassment. I knew about it before. So you don't need to be trying to arrange it. I already saw it before I came to you. Oh, it made me to relax. That's why you know, the song, I love that song a lot. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not a place that he will not go with me. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about my struggles. He will guide till my day is done. There is not a friend 
like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. The security I have is that it was his mercy that brought me. That's why I'm not afraid of losing ministry. I'm not afraid of that. I don't know. I'm not afraid of losing people. Hallelujah. You can't threaten me and say, I will go away from here. No problem. If you can go, go. You know why? If it is his mercy that gave you to me, I don't know where you are going. In fact, when you have gone, 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 you will return. I say, excuse me, can I, can you have mercy on me and let me come back? I say, no, it's not me, it's not my mercy. You need his mercy to have your space here. That's why all the brothers that are working with us, we don't bribe anybody. <clears throat> we don't bribe them with position, we don't bribe them with name, we don't bribe them with salary, we don't bribe them with anything. We all see it as the mercy of God that is allowing us to be involved in what heaven is doing. We have renounced hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God how deceitfully. We don't short measure the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience, in the sight of God. Do you understand how to live when you live here? Eh? Do you understand what to pursue as you live here? Be frank with God. So, let's take the last point. So that I can let you pray. Hallelujah. Now, you know, between verse 7 of chapter 3, and verse 11. Brother Paul was dealing with the fact that what God has called us into is not a fading glory. The ministry into which God is bringing me and you, the assignment that God wants us to be involved in, it is not ordinary. It's not, it's not what can fade away. Listen, you know some years ago, brothers and sisters, I'll tell you a little story. When I started preaching in the area where God sent us, some group of pastors met me and they had two problems with me. What is the first problem? They said, Bragbile, you make the word of God too explicit to our members. So that there is nothing that we can tell them that they do not know. You are making us gradually irrelevant. Because when they come for your meeting, what we will spend six months, we will just be bringing in a small, small. You will bring it out all in one meeting, one weekend. You say, somebody said, one message you preach. I made about five sermons out of one message. So one said, look, if you keep doing like this, you will run out of messages and you will not have anything to tell people <laughs> again. You need to learn how to do what? Short measure it. You just give small at a time. Small so that they can keep coming. I didn't know that that could be a problem to a preacher. They were so offended. They said, look, there's nothing now that we can say again. It was then it dawned on me. I said, ah, so preachers, they're afraid. So it was then I discovered that when the Bible said, we do not short measure the word of God. They, I didn't know. So when I knelt down to pray, the Lord said to me, if you are drawing from an ocean, 
when will it finish? But if you are drawn from a, a keg, a, a tank, a tank, if you draw too much water from a tank, what will finish? It will soon finish. Your tank will soon run dry. And God said, look, that's why I'm not asking you to get a tank. I just want you to connect to the ocean that never runs dry. That's why we are not afraid of showing you everything that we have known. Everything that makes us who we are, we are willing to let you have it. When we talk of discipleship, we tell you what is peculiar about our lives. So that what we have become, you will become and even much more. And you say, hey, if you do that, will you still be relevant? Why not? Why not? Do you know that when you have grown so well and you have become what God wants you to become, you will only become who you are supposed to be. You will not take my place. Eh? That's why we want to raise leaders. We raise leaders because they can't take my place. Did you enjoy what Brother Matthew did today? Did you like him? Eh? Did he bless you so much? Yes. No problem. That's what we are happy with. We are happy to see disciples become great for God. When he has finished all that God gave him to say, it has nothing to do with what God has put in my mouth. Do you understand that now? Nothing. He would draw and draw and draw. He can draw so much. But that doesn't affect what I'm going to draw. Because the Baba is an ocean. We do not short measure the word of God. So the glory into which God is bringing us is not the one that can fade. If we don't change, this ministry cannot fade. It can only grow from strength to strength. As you are here now, by God's grace, Zimbabwe, Kenya, wherever you come from, by the grace of God, we want you to be the greatest you can be. Are you understanding? That doesn't affect me. I would just be happy that you have entered the will of God and you are doing well. That's why we, are will, we will show you anything that we know can help you. All the secret that we have enjoyed with God. It's yours. Come and collect it. But when God has called us to this kind of ministry of glory, the Bible now says, because the glory that God has called us to is more glorious than that which fades away, the kind that Moses stood in. When Moses noticed that the glory was fading, what did he begin to do? He began to hide. So that people will not see the end of a fading glory. But the glory to which God has called us, the ministry to which God is enlisting you, is the one that is not going to be abolished. Because it is the glory of Jesus. And it's from one degree of glory to another degree of glory to another degree of glory. So he said, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Did you see that in this meeting, are we speaking bogus English? Eh? Are we being playing with you? That's our lifestyle. We use plainness of speech. Plainness. We don't go and assemble some eye sanding words, something, something, zim, something, zim, something, zim, 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 something, 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 G. Then you say, Kai, oh, 
I didn't understand what he said, boy. And before you go understand, I said, Sherry Bobobo Sandra Baba Kunda Ribo. So that you say, ha, ah, mm, the spirit just took over. The spirit just took over. The spirit don't just take over like that. It's all part of gimmicks. It's all part of gimmicks. Just to daze you. Just to make you feel you don't know where, where you are now. You say, we are in the spirit realm. Ha, ba, ba, ba. Mm, God. What does that mean? What is all of that drama all about? What is it all about? Just to daze ignorant people. Just to make some of you say, oh, let me just go to this man of God. Let him just breathe upon me. Let him just breathe upon me. You see, last year when I was in Australia, the Spirit just told me that I should just blow upon the people. They will just fall. If you don't have a wrong spirit, when I blow on you, you will fall now. You see, that is all a conditioning. That's what I call psychological conditioning. That if you don't have a wrong spirit, when we blow now, you fall under the anointing. So do you know that everybody is already planning to do what? <laughs> conditioned. Conditioned. So when they fell, what did they become? Nothing. They stood up just as they fell. Some broke their neck. No, don't go for that. There's an authentic anointing from the Holy Spirit. It's an anointing that is deep and real. It's not mystic. It's real. So because we are sure we can use plainness of speech. We are sure we can be plain. We don't have to be... We don't have to be doing something as if we are doing magic. It can be plain. The word of God can be plainly understood. Hallelujah. The word of God can be studied. You can see the chronology of God's word. You can see issues that stop God from moving with people. And if you avoid it, God will walk with you. Are we together? So we use plainness of speech. Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face. That the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remains the same veil on taking away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is still upon their heart. They can't understand. Nevertheless, that's where we're stopping this morning. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the spirit of the Lord. Now when our brother began this morning and said there is something that you must go away here to pursue. I felt that God had already given us a clear word that you should not forget. But because not all of us were already seated I will need to repeat that. That what God is looking for as vessels for glory are men that are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. The essence of discipleship is to make you to become like Jesus. The essence of discipleship is for Christ to be formed in you. When you stand on the pulpit, let men see nothing but Jesus. When you lay your hands on the sick, let it be as though Jesus were laying his hands. 
when you show compassion to people, let it be as though this is Jesus helping people. When you love your wife, let it be as Christ loved the church. Are you hearing me? When you walk with God in such a way that God could also stand up and say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. You know, I'm still praying. I'm begging God for that. I'm seeing a little of it, but I want something more. I want God to be able to go to places without me sending and bills, without me doing any elaborate posters. God being able to walk into people's bedroom and say, do you want a man of God that can help you? Do you want something that will take you into a lasting experience? You say yes. So this, this man, this brother, is my son. Hear him. That's what I want. I've experienced a bit of it. I'm looking for more. So when, you know, I'm sitting down. I'm listening to some of you. I'm hearing some of you saying. And you know, I was praying and in my, in my, in my dream or in, in, my, in my vision or as I was praying, God said, go to Boko. Such stories, I am familiar with them. Because that's what I'm looking for. I don't want to be the one inviting. Say, come. Come to us. We are doing something good. No. If God has not introduced us to you, it's a useless thing. You understand? But for God to do that, there's something he's looking for. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Do you know that this happened two times? Eh? The first time was a little different. You will not know. What is the first time? At Jonah, when Jesus was baptized, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Full stop. There was nothing about hearing him. You understand? The first time, God was only introducing Jesus, his life, his character. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God said that and nothing else was said. The next chapter, the Bible said, and Jesus being led of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. And you know what Satan came to test? If you are the son of God. Did you hear that? In the Earlier chapter, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, Satan said, let's test that. If you are the son of God, command the stones to become bread. Why was that? It was because the first thing that God needed to identify before you can tell people to hear you is who you are first. This is my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased. It has nothing to do about preaching yet. Many of you, you want to start on the level of preaching. No, 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 no. What God is looking for is me, my life. Can he introduce my life to somebody? So Satan quickly wants to destroy that testimony. So if you are the son of God, do this. Uh, Jesus said, mm -mm. man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. So you, see, you know what Jesus is doing? Jesus is saying, I can go hungry to please my father. Nothing is important. And I'm telling you, some of us, by the grace of God, 
we have come to that point. God has brought us to a point where nothing is as important as pleasing God. It's not money. Do you know that we started some ministries before? When God queried it, what did we do to it? We closed it down. We lost millions. That's not important. I need the favor of God on my life than to have things. I want to be a man that God can say, look at him. He's my beloved. And to me, that is more important than anything. If this thing we are doing here, if it will come between me and the Savior, what am I going to do? I'll throw it away. It's not important. It's not important. Ministry is good, but it's not at the expense of me and Jesus relating. So you know the song I was teaching you yesterday? Nothing between my soul and my Savior. Not of this world, the lucid dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine, there's nothing between. Nothing between. Like pride or station, self or friend shall not intervene. Though it may cost me much tribulation, I am resolved there's nothing between. That's the first thing. We all with unveiled face. Let's be sure that there's no veil between you and the Savior. Let's be sure that there's nothing standing between you. Let me ask you, young girls, sisters that are not married, will you promise us in the presence of God that no man will come between you and the Savior? Eh? Do you know that it's better to die single than to marry a man that separates you from the Lord? Eh? Do you know that it's more honorable to serve God as a single, single person than to have children that will never allow you to see the glory of God? Do you know that marriage is a privilege? And it's a privilege that ends here on earth. Some married only two years and they became widow. Eh? So what is it? If it does not enhance your relationship with God, get away with it. Can I ask you, honestly, sisters and brothers, Young men, do you promise that there will be nothing between you and the Savior? That you really, really want to run with God until you get him? And that between you and the Savior, there will be nothing. Nothing between. Like pride or station. Self or friends shall not intervene. Though it may cause me more tribulation, I am resolved there's nothing between, nothing between my soul and my Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing Preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear. Let nothing between. 
the least of his favor. The least of his favor. Don't want anything to prevent it. I don't want anything to prevent it. Between me and my wife, we know that. That anything that will prevent the least of God's favor, it will go. It will go. It doesn't matter how much it costs, it will go. Because what is, what is life if Jesus is not there? What does a man worth in the absence of Jesus? What is it all about? What is money if Jesus is not there? Do you know that there will be food in the house? But when Jesus is not with you, you can't eat. So what is the need? What is the need? Let's make a decision that we all with unveiled face. As you are going from this meeting, determine that there will be no veil between you and the Savior. You will look at anything and everything that will stand between you and the Savior and say, no. It doesn't worth it. Excuse me. No man worth standing between you and the Savior. Doesn't matter what the man has. Useless. No job on earth is worth standing between you and the Savior. No church, no ministry, no position is worth standing between me and the Savior. Nothing. No ministry. No organization. No material. No house. Is worth standing between me and the Savior. Nothing. 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 It's worth it. For me not to be in fellowship with Jesus. Ah, I'm finished. What makes me living? You know, I'm, I live well. I'm strong by the grace of God. I'm in good health. All because of Jesus. What will you pay me if you take Jesus away from my life? What will you, and I'm sincerely asking you, what will you pay me? And I hear some young men say, you know, I will be with you, I'll be with you for how long? For how long will a boy be with you before he litters you? Even if he was sincere to be with you, death can finish him now, now. And he's gone. Oh, no, no, no. It doesn't worth it. Tell somebody by your side. It doesn't worth standing between me and my Savior. It doesn't. And we all with unveiled face. Beholding the glory of the Lord. Now, that's the second last point. When God finds a man and says, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's the beginning. The devil will come and try that. The devil will say, okay, command this thing to become bread and we will give you all the glory. So, no, no, no. Jesus said, get it behind me. Get it behind me. Get it behind me. Now, after some years, Jesus has traveled in life. He has done all that he was doing. The devil tempted him at every point. He found nothing. He went to the Mount of Transfiguration. And while Jesus was praying, the Bible said, he was transfigured. The Bible said, his cloth was so whitened that nothing can be, can whiter it. That's the language in, the, in King James, that nothing, can, nothing is whiter than it. And as the glory was breaking forth, Moses, Elijah, they all came to worship him, to lay down their crown. 
I could hear Moses say, whatever people thought I am, nothing compared with you. Elijah rushed down, nothing. And the Bible said, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Do what? Hear him. You see, for me, that's progress. That's what I'm looking for. Don't worry about me, for that's my prayer. I want to be a man that God can boldly introduce to people in their consciences, in their family, in your bedroom. You know, sometimes, Brother Bile will become a discussion in your bedroom. Between you and your wife, there will be a discussion. And God will be saying, go and submit to this man. Your wife will say, ah, me also, that's what the Spirit is telling me, but I, I think it's difficult, it's difficult, it's difficult. Let's do it next year. Then you will have no peace. And I will be going my own journey on my own, oh, and you will have no peace. And sometimes you say, you didn't even greet us, you didn't even invite us. Why should I invite you? Did I invite you? Is it my business to invite you? He who is inviting you is the one you have to deal with. I have no problem about that. When you reply and say, the Lord said we should hear you. I say, let me check whether it is God. And if it is not God, I say, please go back again. We are not sure about that. We need ministry that originates by divine introduction. It will happen. Don't worry. Some of you are saying, how will people come? They will come. Very soon, sir. Premiers, they will come and sit down here. Bishops, they will be coming and sitting down. You say, but what is making this bishop to come? You say, well, the Lord said I should go there. Mercy, not merit. So, are you interested in that? As you go from here this morning, we commend you to the Lord that with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord as in a glass, you also, you are being changed. Is that all right? Into the same likeness from one degree. So I'm happy to end by saying from one degree of glory what it means that this is a progressive experience. A progressive glory. It's not a one-time thing. There's a glory, there's a glory. From glory to glory to glory to glory. Are you hearing me? You will, there will be a glory. And just when you're about settling at it, God will show you how inglorious what you call glory is. You say, hey, God, ah, ah, is to move you to the next level. Some of you say, I don't know why I'm always feeling that I've not arrived. You will not arrive. Because the glory to which God has called you is inexhaustible. You hear me? It's inexhaustible. The glory of Jesus is inexhaustible. And you need to move from one degree of that glory to another degree. May the Lord bless you. I think I can pray with you this morning. But I want you to take two decisions. Because mercy brought you. Not merit. There's nothing to protect. Nothing to hide. Please open up today. Come and tell God, Lord, I'm renouncing. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Let's stand up as we sing the song. Jesus is mine. There's nothing between. Hymn number nine. We're singing it, and as we sing it, I want you to take your decisions before God. 
we will be singing it as unto the Lord. And this morning, it's a time to just commend you to heaven as we release you. And while we're singing, this final, you feel that there are hidden things that you just want to make bare before God today and say, Lord, now I know. It's not impression. It's not impression that brought me. It's your mercy. It's not merit. I don't want to be impressing you. I want to be real. Since mercy brought me, I am I'm secure to let you see everything about me. Don't hide. And if, let's say this morning, all through the time we have been praying, there are hidden things you've not opened to the Lord. You've tried to be nice. And you are just trying to go back to manage that kind of craftiness. You say, Lord, no. I just want to be real. From this meeting, I'm going to be real. The discipleship process that I'm going to be involved in, I'm going to pursue it with all my heart until I become like Jesus. I'm not going to play church. I'm going to pursue Jesus. I'm not going to play hypocrisy. I'm not going to be talking bigger than what I am. I want to pursue reality. We take the song, and as we take the song, this final time, you sense that let me just open my life to him. Particularly, let me not go back having not opened something to God. When we sing it, I will not invite you again. But if you feel, yes, let me just open my life to God. I have renounced all hidden things of dishonesty. I don't want the devil to say, I know something about you. Mercy brought me, not merit. Such people should just walk before God here and just say, I have renounced. Just walk as we are singing the song and take your position before the Lord and let this money be a turning point that God can hold on to and say, yes, yeah, this young man, he has recognized my mercy. He knows that it is not those who are whole that I'm looking for, but those who are sick. And he's happy to acknowledge that, yes, I am sick. I need a doctor. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Not of this world, the elusive dream. I have renounced. Oh, sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine. There's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and my Savior. So that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear. Let nothing between. Nothing between thy worldly pleasure. Habits of life, though I'm less the same. Must not my heart from him ever save her? He is my all. There's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and my Savior. So that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear. Let nothing between.